So what have we done today? We, we've actually rewritten the textbooks today. We say, okay, Darwin's theory is, is not about acquired characteristics. It's not about adaptation, but rather it, it's about mutations. That's it. That's going to get us what we need. Well, again, that's kind of interesting. Because realistically, beneficial mutations are the exception to the rule. Take a look. Ernst Meyer, very well-known evolutionary taxonomist. Lived to be a, oh, 100 years old. He wrote a book called What Evolution Is. And in that book, he said any mutation that induces changes in the phenotype will either be favored or discriminated against by natural selection. The occurrence of new beneficial mutations is rather rare. It's exactly what Kavali Savorza said, that one of the guys who head up the Human Genome Project, he said genetic mutations are spontaneous. Chance changes, which are rarely beneficial, and more often have no effect or a deleterious effect. Okay, so wait a second. You're saying that, that mutations are driving evolution, but number one, they're rare, and number two, they don't usually have a good effect. We add to that what Stephen Jay Gould admitted to. Stephen Jay Gould, very well-known evolutionist, passed away several years ago. He said, a mutation doesn't produce major new raw material. You don't make a new species by mutating the species. That's a common idea people have, that evolution is due to random mutations. Mutation is not the cause of evolutionary change. In fact, Dr. Pierre Grasset, he actually landed the plane on this one. He said to the contemporary biologists, as soon as they observe a mutation, they talk about evolution. No matter how numerous they may be, mutations do not produce any kind of evolution. The opportune appearance of mutations permitting animals and plants to meet their needs seems hard to believe. He goes on to say, yet the Darwin theory is even more demanding. A single plant, a single animal, would require thousands and thousands of lucky appropriate events. Thus, miracles would become the rule. Events with an infinitesimal probability could not fail to occur. There's no law against daydreaming, but science must not indulge in it. Okay, folks, we got a problem. If mutations aren't going to get you there, if that's not the cause of evolutionary change, what is? The shame of this portion of Dr. Harab's talk is that he got so close to making a very legitimate point. Unfortunately, he has such a poor understanding of the actual research, I still have some work to do in correcting his fundamental mistakes. First, it will help if we toss out the idea of beneficial, harmful, and neutral mutations or traits as far too simplistic. Don't get me wrong, he's absolutely right when he's quoting scientists saying beneficial mutations are rare harmful mutations slightly more common, but that neutral mutations are the rule, the vast, vast majority. That's just the cartoon version we might use in the classroom, though. Let me introduce you to the fitness landscape. Imagine that the elevation above the plane is how beneficial a trait is, and the elevation below the plane is a harmful effect. The surface being described here are all possible variations in the sequence of the gene. So, for example, if we have a gene that makes an enzyme that breaks down lactose, the surface would be every permutation of sequence that could make that enzyme. There may be thousands or tens of thousands of possible sequences, and we assign to each of them a fitness based on that variation's ability. What you will notice is that most of the plane is flat. That's because most sequences are about equal. It's easy to explain this on two factors. One. Not every nucleotide base is equally important. Some mutations don't alter which amino acid is encoded by that codon. Most mutations have absolutely no effect on the amino acid sequence of the protein. These are called synonymous changes. Two, not every amino acid in a protein is equally important. Most of the protein structure is really resistant to changes in a single amino acid. In fact, we can exploit that fact to find where the functional parts are in a protein by changing each amino acid, one by one, to the simplest amino acid, alanine, a process that's called alanine scanning. Even the active site of the protein, the working bit, 
may not be all that sensitive to certain changes. Of the 22 amino acids, they can generally fit into one of four or five categories that are very similar. Substituting a similar amino acid at an active site might have little or no effect. So that's why so many mutations are neutral. Why are so few beneficial? This is fairly straightforward. They should already be at a local maximum, a high point on our fitness landscape. But here's a key point. They may not be at the global maximum, the highest fitness level, because getting there would require going down in fitness, down the slope of the peak, and then back up another. What this means in real terms is you must significantly alter multiple amino acids at the active site of the protein, each in turn. This is what Michael Behe claims is impossible. So how would you find that global maximum? You'd need some process that made random expeditions down the mountain. Unfortunately, from the fitness peak, every little movement will be downwards towards decreased fitness, which we will call a harmful mutation. However, if by chance you move far enough away from the local fitness peak, you might stumble by chance on the slope of a much larger fitness peak with a higher maximum. It will be rare because of how much change is required, but that will be a beneficial mutation event. And it will usually result in a new function or enhanced function, like our lactase increasing how quickly it works or how much energy is required or even beginning to digest a related sugar like sucrose. So to review, the reason why neutral mutations dominate change is that most DNA-based changes don't have much effect on amino acids, and most amino acids don't have much impact on protein function. The reason that most non-neutral mutations are harmful is that the organism is already at a local maximum through a long process of trial and error. The reason why some rare mutations produce a beneficial effect is that it allows the protein to explore some new space that contains an even greater fitness peak, which may functionally include the ability to do some new thing, digest some new food source, or enhance their metabolic efficiency. That's the basics, and would serve for a non-scientific audience, but there are a few things we haven't addressed. 1. Gene duplication. You really cannot talk about the origin of new function without understanding the ways that genes, or indeed whole genomes, are duplicated, then allowed great freedom to roam the fitness landscape while the original copy remains safely ensconced on top of that local maximum. 2. The changing environment. When I say throw out the terms beneficial and harmful, it's because those terms suggest a fixed environment that always selects for one particular trait. In fact, the world that we live in is so constantly changing. The abiotic elements of weather and raw material, but also more importantly the biotic elements, other organisms, apply dynamic selection pressure to each other. Pathogens have driven human evolution as much as diet and weather. Other organisms form social communities or set up commensal relationships. 3. Horizontal gene transfer. Species are also capable of swapping genetic material, and it happens quite frequently. This can happen through retroviruses that pick and move genes from one organism to another, or in the case of bacteria, through plasmid exchanges. 4. Sex. Besides giving the internet something to put on most of its websites, Sex is also important to understand the impact of mutation on fitness. I'll save that for another time, though. Lastly, I want to address some of the quotes Dr. Hare abused. Ernst Meyer's quote to the effect that beneficial mutations are rare, I think I've already addressed. Stephen Jay Gould's quote that mutations don't create new species was actually addressing a creationist misconception of what mutations can do. It changes the function of a protein, but only reproductive isolation creates a new species. It's confusing phyletic change with species change, a common misconception. Then we come to Pierre-Paul Grasset, a French zoologist. Grasset was the last of the Neo-Lamarckians, an idea that had a brief revival a few decades ago in France. Grasset had absolutely no problem with evolution, as evidenced in the following quote. He merely argued in the 1970s that the mechanism by which it occurs has not yet been fully understood, 
At the time, in the pre-genomic era, he was very right. In his own time, we didn't have the tools to understand the multiple mechanisms by which organisms change. Here's his quote from the 1977 book, Evolution of Living Organisms. Zoologist and botanists are nearly unanimous in considering evolution as a fact and not a hypothesis. I agree with this position and base it primarily on documents provided by paleontology, that is, the history of the living world. Dr. Harrop, if you're watching, I want to assure you that neither of us believe in this one-dimensional, silly version of evolution that you're struggling against. It's a shame you didn't actually read more of what Mayer or Gould had to say, because they were both addressing the problem you pretend to wrestle with. I've taken some short sections from interviews with both men, Mayer from the year 2000, interviewed at the American Institute of Biological Sciences, and Dr. Gould from a TV Ontario interview by Alan Gregg from 1995. Bear with me while you listen to the men you are quoting answer the very question you are asking. But, for instance, when we look at the world and we can see that a species, now go back to biology, a species changes from generation to generation and the fossil record, if we have a good fossil record, we can see the actual change of a species into a new species. But that still leaves open the problem, how do new species originate? Because uh, we have a great multiplicity of species, and we occasionally have big extinctions where much of the fauna and flora is exterminated, and then is the gap is filled in again by multiple new species. So the problem is, how does a new species originate, or more specifically, how does a species, how is the multiplication of species produced? The change in a column of a species can be explained, but how do multiple species develop. That's a typical problem, and that has been argued about for the longest time. And Darwin tried to solve it and was not successful. But then in the so-called evolutionary synthesis, the uh, solution was proposed and is now got rather generally adopted. And the solution is, in a way, quite simple, which is that every species is not a, a simple type but a species is a series of populations spread out in geography, and speciation occurs when a rather isolated part of, this, of such a species becomes totally isolated, and then in this isolation changes genetically like all populations do all the time, and then the changes in this isolated population reach finally to the, the, the degree, the point, the level, that when it comes together again after the breakdown of the isolation with the parental species or with sister species, they do not interbreed anymore, which shows that this isolated population during the period of isolation had become a different species. Now here was the problem, but here is the solution of the problem. And so it is in all through science, we certainly see something that puzzles us and we ask a question and we have some ideas about it, then we test these ideas and finally a theory is formed and confirmed and the problem is solved. And, 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 and stops. Could, could we be in a period right now of, of stasis? Is that we no should be. That's what all evolutionary theory would predict evolution is concentrated in episodes of speciation or the branching of new lineages off from ancestral stocks. Branchings occur when small populations get isolated geographically from their parental stock. The reason why humans represent a stable species, and theory says we should, is that we have so little capacity for forming small isolated populations that could ever speciate, as I said. In the, four to five billion of us, we live all over, we move around, we have this terrible habit of interbreeding everywhere we go. And there's no way short of some speculation about a space colony that you can even imagine how a small population might get isolated enough to produce in the course of tens of generations a, a new species. And there you have it from the men you quoted. I hope that helps to clear up your confusion. I'll leave you with one final thought from Dr. Gould. Thanks for watching. Yeah.
But you did have a very big concern uh, about the teaching of creationism. But that's either. different. That's not religion. No, that's, no, I know it isn't. I know it isn't. But I, I, I want to talk about kind of what, what's, what's the harm of offering two notions out there. Do you um, want to teach manifest falsehood? I mean, I think if I, if I were an educator, indeed I am, I would object very strongly to a legal requirement that I teach absolutely manifest falsehood as an alternative to something we're pretty sure is true. After all, it's